Hello and welcome to my channel where we talk about tips and tricks for teaching elementary music. All right, let's get started. So for today's video, I want to talk about how to create that musical performance to put on for an audience. In the elementary music world, at least in my district, we call those things programs. We don't call them concerts because a concert has a little different connotation. You imagine a concert being like you have a set of songs and it's just all musical. Whereas an elementary music performance usually has some speaking parts in it, some dancing in it, some uh, instrument playing and some singing in it. So it, it's, it's more like a play in a little bit of respect than it is a traditional concert. So from this point forward, I will refer to them as programs. So the first thing that I want to look at is creating a checklist. There are so many moving parts to what you're going to be doing with creating a program. You have to design it or discover it if somebody else did it. You have to arrange it so that it fits your students. You have to assign all of these things. You have to be the director, the producer, the costume designer a lot of times. You have to be the publicist. There's so many roles that you wear when you're creating one of these programs. Sometimes you're even the script writer. I've been that before as well. Okay, so let's look at this checklist that I made and you make whatever works for you, but these are just some ideas to get you started. First thing you have to do is choose your program. Then you make your charts and or copy sheet music. Then you wanna assign your songs to classes. So you look at the song and you say, okay, I know I want this particular song to be a dance song and I'm gonna um, assign it to kindergarten, class, whatever, right? So these are just some of the things and we'll walk through the rest of this checklist but right now I want to go um, focus on the first part of this right here, which is choose the program. Okay, so if you look up here, I have a website open called Poplar's Music. There are many websites out there that have products for general music classes. And in this particular website, I went under general music and I went down to musical plays and I clicked on general. You can see all the different categories that are up here. You've got Broadway, Disney, so on and so forth going on down the line. Okay. There's a whole section for holiday because most elementary music educators will have to do at least two programs a year. And one of them usually is a December program where you're expected to cover holidays. And then the other program could be a spring program that could be any theme that you want it to be, or there could be another specific program that your principal wants you to have. You might end up doing more than two programs a year. All right, so you've got all your choices here. Let's just scroll through. So, um, let's look at this barnyard musical. So it tells you all about it, and you can see how many songs are in it, right? And it tells you kind of the level, so it'd be good for K through two. So it gives you a chance to listen to a little bit of it. I'm not going to play the whole thing. I've never looked actually looked at this before, but I just wanted to give you an idea that um, you can listen to samples to see if you even like the music at all before you decide to purchase. And the advantage to getting one of these particular pre-made programs already done, you've got all your songs picked out. A lot of times they will have costuming suggestions. They might have choreography suggestions and they a lot of times will have speaking parts as well. So the advantage to picking something out like this is it's already done and it has a sense of cohesiveness. It goes together. It's less work for you to decide um, what speaking part do I want them to say? Which song do I want to do next? There's less guesswork, right? So this definitely could be an idea. 
I'm not necessarily talking about this particular musical. I mean, use it if you want, but I mean the general idea of an all-in-one musical that you, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six songs. So that's a good variety of songs there. And, you know, if you feel like you needed to add one or two more to lengthen out the program, it shouldn't be too difficult to find some songs about animals that would go along with it. Okay. So there's definitely an advantage and you can see this is this is pretty standard price that you see over here for a all-in-one musical like this. Now I will caution you if you decide to do these all-in-one musicals, you need to be very aware of the requirements by the publishers. So for example, the Broadway which I usually don't do these at all because they usually first of all they're more expensive. And secondly, they usually have a requirement that you have to um, perform it in its entirety. Okay. So for the other one that we just looked at, that Barnyard Musical, if I didn't want to do one of the songs and I wanted to sub in a different song instead, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Because I've been given permission to use the songs in a performance, but I'm not required to use them in a specific order and all that. But the Broadway ones, a lot of times will have, I don't know why that's only $10. Let's go back and that must be for just the one song. The Broadway plays usually have show kit. Let's click on the show kit. There you go. You can see the price right there much more expensive, but it comes with 30 librettos, a director script, um, the CD that has the accompaniment track on it, a choreography DVD. Okay. So it does come with all of that, but a lot of times you have to get, um, it doesn't say on this right here, but I've know that other educators that have done the Broadway shows before they've had to do them in their entirety or there's some sort of fine that they could face if they do not, okay? So just keep those in mind as you're looking around if you wanna do like an all-in-one kit of something. So now I wanna give you another idea, and that is picking out your own songs. So maybe you pick songs out from the music books that are in your classroom. Maybe you pick songs out that uh, another music teacher told you about. Maybe you pick a popular song. And by popular songs, I mean things that have been on the radio that are not like made for like children's programs. Okay. We're just talking about a song on the radio. I remember using the Jackson 5 up on a housetop that uh, another teacher created a dance to that was really fun. So I used that in a holiday program one year. So that's just an example of taking a song that you wouldn't necessarily think of using in a program and going ahead and putting your own thing on it and putting it in the program. So Music K8 is a website that you can buy individual songs. You can also buy, they have a magazine that comes out four times a year or is it five times a year? I'm not sure which. I think it's four times a year. That, um, no, it's five. That has a bunch of songs in it with a CD recording and they also have digital files if you'd rather do it that way. It's a really good um, supplement to have in your classroom because you could pull some of these songs for programs or you could just use some of these songs for general instruction. And they tend to do all the all the different themes. Like you can find songs about any holiday you can think of. Halloween, Groundhog Day, Valentine's Day, Christmas, Kwanzaa. I mean, they've got like all the different holidays and then there'll be other like silly songs about different themes going on so it's kind of a good subscription to have and i think they run about 130 130 for a year subscription but i just want you to look at this one particular song i've actually used this song before um it, as a finale for my program it's a twist on the we wish you a merry christmas it's called we wish you a swinging holiday and it's a jazz song, which I love, and it's got scat singing in it. It's got two parts going on at the same time, and it's really fun to do with like your whole group of kids at the end of a program. It makes a great finale, but I just want you to listen to it because I want to talk about what some other things that you could choose to do with it. So let's just listen to a little bit of it.
as a vocalist, I tend to listen to songs for singability first. Like, do I want to set this aside as a singing song or am I willing to put it over and be an instrumental piece or a dance piece? And this song could actually be used as a dance piece very easily. It's got a nice tempo to it. It's got a lot of fun things going on in the percussion. So it, it would be very danceable for sure. You could create your own routine to go along with it and that would be great. I like the singing part of it because it's got some great scat singing in the middle of it as well, which we'll listen to in just a minute. Now, as far as using it as an instrumental piece, you definitely can use it as a non-pitched instrumental piece without any problem, even without seeing the notated music, because you wouldn't need to know what key it was in necessarily. And you could create some sort of, you know, maracas and drums and whatever you wanted to put with it as an instrumental piece. And what I would do is I would make a decision if I was going to do it as, a, as an instrumental piece, am I going to play it with the voices in the background or am I going to play the accompaniment version without the voices? It just depends on what I think um, would work best with the particular song. You could do it either way. It really doesn't matter if, if you've got a class that's playing maracas and drums to the song. It doesn't really matter if it's got lyrics going on to it or not. It's your choice which way you want to roll with that. And as far as um, the scat singing, let's listen to a little bit of So it's really fun because the, so the first verse is all, you know, English words. The second verse is all um, scat singing. And then the third time they put the two together. So you have one group that's scat singing and one group that's singing the actual words. And it's just a really fun way to close out a program. That's why I like using it as a finale. And you do kind of want to have, this is definitely a showstopper type song you want to have at least one showstopper in your program. And we'll talk more about how to structure your programs here in a minute. So let's go back to that program checklist. Okay, so you have chosen your program. You've got your songs picked out. I will tell you, I like to have 10 songs, okay? Um, it's just been a formula that has worked for me is you have at least 10 songs that gives you enough time in your program to put on a decent variety of songs and a variety of things that are happening musically. And the parents don't feel like they only came out for four songs. It doesn't make the program so long that people are wishing that it was over, okay? So 10 seems to be about the magical number for me. So that musical barnyard thing that we looked at only had six songs to it. So if I had bought that program, I think it was only six, I would have to add songs to it to make it for my 10 or 11 songs. Let me back up for just a minute, literally and figuratively, <laughs> back up my chair. Um, one of the best things that I learned from another teacher was how to structure the program. So what I do is I have my chorus students, my fifth graders, they are on risers and the risers are on the floor of the auditorium sitting right in front of the stage. And they stay there that whole time. They stand up to sing, then they sit down when things are going on on the stage. Then the curtain will open and another group will be performing on the stage. So it goes back and forth like this. Riser stage, riser stage, riser stage, riser stage. It doesn't always start with risers. It could start with stage. But the whole idea being while the chorus is singing on the stage, the next group is getting into position behind the curtain. So as soon as the chorus is done, they can sit down and I might have a little speaking part going on in between the songs. And as soon as those speaking parts are over with, the curtain opens up and the next group performs. Then the curtain closes, chorus stands up, we, re we repeat the process. And this saves time in transitions. It also saves time from boredom, and et cetera, et cetera. So, you're going to teach the songs, then you're going to teach the dance and the instrumentation, right? Uh, I have to choose my actors or soloists if I have either one of those. 
I have to send home a script letter. So if I'm going to take the time to do a more of a play style where it's like big parts and the students have a lot of words to memorize, I'm going to send home a letter to the parents saying, I'd like your student to do such and such a part in this upcoming thing on such and such a day. Can you please let me know if they're available? On the other hand, if I'm only going to have them do something that's written on an index card that doesn't have to be memorized, that anybody can go up and say for me, then I won't send that letter home because if that student doesn't show up, no problem. My fifth grade course kids love to do speaking parts and they would be thrilled to take that on if somebody didn't show up on that particular day. So then it says send home letter number one to the grade level and the chorus. Another thing to keep in mind when you're structuring your program is aim for variety. For example, if I'm going to have singing, moving, and playing throughout my whole program, I want to kind of go singing, play, sing, dance, sing, play. You see what I'm saying? Kind of go back and forth. Don't like have all of your singing songs together, all of your playing songs together, all of your dance songs together. Make a variety. Also, when you're choosing your music, choose a variety of music. It could be a variety of styles for sure, but I'm speaking more tempo and dynamics. You don't want to have your entire program be this high energy the whole entire time and all the way to the end. You want to have some lows too. So you want to have a slower song in there or a softer song in there or a different mood. Maybe it's a minor piece instead of a major piece at one point. Or maybe you do something that's completely a cappella, or something that is just an instrumentation that has no backing track to it. So, in, so just keep these things in mind. You wanna vary up the song choices that you have and also make them varied in the order that you put them in. So we're going to look at a parent letter because you do need to let the parents know that it's coming up and what the children need to wear and times that they need to come and all that. So here we go. So you can see that I said, dear parents, as the music teacher here at, and I'm not showing you my school's name, I'm delighted to inform you that your child's class has been chosen to perform in the next PTA program that I named the program and I tell them when, and I always put that in bold. And then you can see my little chart that I put up there. This is how I do my costuming. I do solids, tops in a particular color. And then I often will create, or I've, usually I create it mostly myself, but I've also had PTA help me out sometimes as well. I will create some sort of necklace for lack of a better word. So it might be, I'm just using this as an example. If they were singing a song about snowflakes, it might be a piece of black paper with a white snowflake on it. And it's got a piece of yarn here and a piece of, and, and then the yarn comes over here and they put it over their neck as like a necklace and it's hanging in front of a black shirt. That's exactly what I did with this group here that says winter. So it makes for a nice picture. You get some uniformity and it's a lot easier than saying parents, you need to create a costume for your students. You don't want to put that on your parents. So you can see that there's a variety of things that they're wearing. That gives you a, an idea of the parent letter. So let me tell you when to send the parent letter. I send the parent letter a month before the program. Then I will send a reminder letter two weeks before the program. Okay. And in the reminder letter, I will tell them when they have to be there. So in this letter, it's just all about the costume, the date, and the actual time of the program. So for the time that I want the students to show up, I tell them this program was at 6 p.m., I told them to come there at 5.50, 5, 5, p.m. Now, some of you might be saying 10 minutes before, that's not enough time. Yes, it is, because you're going to have plenty of parents that are going to get there at 5.30. You're going to have some parents that are going to try to get there at 5.15, okay? If you say any earlier than 5.50, you are going to have parents there at 4.45 when you're not ready to do anything with any parents yet, okay? I have learned that saying 10 minutes before is plenty of time. 
because at my school, I always give the option for the PTA president or whoever wants to get up there and make a little speech about whatever they need to tell the audience. So they have time for that. Sometimes my principal will get up and make a speech. So it's usually, even though it's a six o'clock start time, a lot of times that first performance piece is not happening until five or 10 minutes afterwards. And by then, whoever's in that first group has shown up. So it's usually no problem. All right, so you've sent those letters home. And like I said, a month beforehand is when I send that first letter home. And then two weeks beforehand is when I send the second letter. Then I will email the teachers of the classes who are in the program. So let me say that in some cases you might get to choose who's in what program and in other cases your principal or another um, team that you might have in your school might choose who performs when. So depending on that, that's how yours is decided. So the school that I'm currently at is the only school that I've taught at that does it this particular way where they want a class or two from each grade level to be represented in each program to show the difference between a kindergarten performing and a fifth grader performing. When I first came there, I had to kind of wrap my head around that because previously all the schools that I taught at were like the entire second grade and the entire third grade, you're in a program together. Okay. Which there are definite advantages to that as well. And I'll talk to you about some of the disadvantages to having it be multiple grades in a program in just a moment. But for the actual program itself, I think it does work out kind of nice because you can show that different, you can have a song that's super, super simple that Kay does, and then a song that's more complex that fourth grade will do, say for example. So that ends up working out really nicely. And you do get more of an audience, because I will tell you that the audience will come out for the younger students much more than they will for the older students. So if you have a program that's just dedicated to your fourth and fifth grade, your audience is gonna be considerably smaller than the audience for like pre-K and kindergarten will be. So although it makes for a really good program to have the variety of grade levels, it is hard on the music teacher, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So if I have three programs a year, and I have five kindergarten classes, and two of them are in the holiday program, and two of them are in the spring program, and one of them is in that third program that's a smaller program, that means that when the, I'm teaching the two that are in the holiday program, the other three are getting what I would call a garden variety lesson plan, right? And the two that are in the holiday program are getting, we're focusing on their program songs, really getting those worked out. So you're doing two different lesson plans a week. Now, the third program that I teach is in November for Veterans Day. So there is a time in the month of October where I've got students that are working on Veterans Day stuff and students that are working on December holiday program stuff and um, one or two classes that are doing that garden variety lesson plan. So it does make it kind of complicated to plan accordingly for that. But after doing this for six years, I've gotten really kind of used to the system and it's fairly easy for me to do. But that first year or two, it was kind of, I had to wrap my head around it. So it can be a little complex. I wouldn't suggest that you suggest to your principal that you want to do this kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth in every single program because it does get complicated for that reason. It's just easier to say, okay, the entire second grade is working on a program, that my second grade lesson plan for the next month is working on a program. So when it comes to how much time that I spend on teaching these students the program, I will teach the program starting eight weeks out from the actual program date. Remember, you only see these students once a week, and in some cases, something might happen that your class is interrupted. Maybe there's a fire drill one day. Maybe there's an assembly one day during that class. Maybe there's a holiday that falls on that class time. Maybe they go on a field trip and they don't see you. So you do need to make sure that you have enough time for them to learn those things. And each one of my classes that's in a program will sing in the finale. So the finale is my big, thing at the end and it's always a singing song and everybody will sing in that that's in the program all 150 or 200 performers however many it is but then the class itself 
will have a song that they are doing maybe completely by themselves, like in the case of chorus, or they might be doing it with another class. So if I had two kindergarten classes in the same program, I'm going to teach them the same song, whether it's a dance song or whether it's a playing song. So I have everybody sing in the finale and the chorus sings all the other singing songs, but then kindergarten, first, second, third, and fourth, and pre-K if they're in the program, will do either a dance song or an instrumental piece. So that's how I structure my programs. Okay, let's get back. So you need to email the teachers and you need to let them know, hey, you're in this upcoming program that's on such and such a day. Um, please set the date aside because the teachers need to be there with their students that night to help them to come in and out of the program and to monitor them when they're not performing. And we'll talk more about where everybody is on the actual program night in just a moment. So then this next thing, and this is um, one of my art teachers from before. So you want them to, um, if you want any scenery or anything, you need to talk to them at least a month or so ahead of time. Uh, make your iPod playlist or however you're going to play the music. Choose any props. List the props. And props can be, in my case, I'll put instruments down on this list. Um, if you need an, extra, an actual prop, like a play prop, you could put that down. Costumes. List the costumes. Obtain all these things. Set up any acting rehearsals. Choose a sound person, which I got to tell you, I always have that up there. But it's always me. I think I had one year that I had somebody else run sound for me and it was just fabulous. I didn't have to worry about the sound system at all, even stopping and starting the iPod. I didn't have to do any of that. Then I've got my second letter to send home, make the program. That's that handout, the, <clears throat> the bulletin that you hand out when you come in saying who's in it and all that. Copy and fold it, set up the big rehearsal, set up the day performance. Um, so I have been in schools before where you would do a big rehearsal on one day and then you'd have a day performance where like the kids that weren't in the program could come see it. Um, my current school doesn't do that. I'm not sure why this is still hanging out here. I, my big rehearsal is the only thing I do. And I'll talk to you about that rehearsal in a moment and email teachers about the rehearsal. You know, this is the rehearsal and you email the, all the staff about the performance. Hey, you know, we have a performance. Please come out and check it out. And then these are things I do on the day of decorate and sound check. And there's a whole bunch of empty space here that always gets filled up, handwritten filled up with things that pertain particularly to that program that I need XYZ to happen in. <clears throat> so you will need help from staff members. There are three positions that you will need the night of the program from a staff member that doesn't have students in the program. This could be somebody who is a classroom teacher that just wants to come and see the program and help you out and their students aren't in it, or it could be somebody like the guidance counselor or the PE teacher. Anybody that's willing to help you out, take the help. You need somebody to sit on that stage behind the curtain and open and close that curtain for you as you're going along on the program. So that's one position. You need two people that are willing to be runners that are gonna to go to the classrooms or the holding spaces of your students and bring them on on time for the program. So my students will be assigned a holding room, which is just a classroom, or it could be the gym because the gym is right next to our auditorium. And they will go there and their classroom teacher will meet them there and monitor them during the program and a runner will come get them and bring them to the stage on time to do their performance and then take them back to the holding room and then bring them back for the finale. So I have all of my students in the finale for two reasons. One, it's a really nice way to end your program that everybody's there doing this ending piece. And two, everybody will stay for the entire program. If you don't have everybody in your finale, you will get parents that after their kid performs that first song or that second song, they're out of there. And by the end, you, you don't have as many parents watching the rest of the students. So it's just a good idea to make your finale an all, um, all performers situation. Let's talk about logistics. I love logistics. <laughs> it really is something fun to me. 
So let's just look at this piece right here. This is something that I would give to my curtain puller and it's something that I would have for myself as well, but I wouldn't send this out to the entire staff. So you can see um, right here, it tells you what the curtain's doing, closed, open, closes, opens, so on and so forth. And you can see that I have what's going on on the front of the stage and then what's going on in the back of the stage. This is not a requirement for you to do, but I just want you to see how many moving parts are going on on a program, okay? So in the beginning, I've got the curtain is closed, a speaker is, is welcoming everybody, and meanwhile, that very first group is getting into place. Then the curtain opens and nobody is speaking, but they are on the stage and they perform their song, okay? And then the curtain closes, and this group right here walks in and stands on the risers and does their song, which I believe was a recorder song. That's why they're on the risers, to be able to be heard a little bit better. And meanwhile, the first group is leaving and the next group is coming on and getting into place and so on and so forth, right? And then you get to your um, finale and there's all the logistics of who's going to stand where in the finale. So in my case, I have three grade levels standing on the floor, some on the risers, some spilling off the risers, and then three grade levels standing up on the um, stage, right? So you just have this and you go through it and you tell them which door they're coming through, et cetera, et cetera, in order to get to where they're supposed to go. It's a lot of logistics and I know a lot of people, their eyes glaze over when they see this, but if you're into logistics, or if you don't want to be confused and don't want other people to be confused, then it might be worth your while to kind of map out where everybody's going to be and when they're going to be there. Now I want to show you the thing that I actually give to my teachers. These are the teachers that have students that are performing. And this is what I give to them on the day of our big rehearsal. So the way I structure things is the day of the program, I will have a big rehearsal that morning for about an hour and a half to two hours that I will block out pretty much the very beginning of the day, usually start at about 9.15 or so and end at about 10.45, 11, depending on how much time I think for that particular program. So all the performing classes have started practicing on the stage about a month before that I just brought them into the auditorium during their class time and we practice on the stage and that's, I'm sorry, that's not all the performing classes. That would be pre-K, K, one, second grade and third grade. I do not do that with fourth grade or fifth grade for two reasons. Fourth grade, I don't do it because their music time with me is during the height of the lunch hour where the lunch room is just fully packed with everybody. And the auditorium that I have is a cafetorium and it just makes it really hard for the fourth graders to hear me trying to tell them what they need to do when there's all that noise behind us in the cafeteria. And the fifth grade doesn't practice until about a week before in there because the stage is where there's another music class going on that's um, fifth grade strings. So we swap spaces about a week before the program so we can get in there on the risers and get used to that. So those are the two classes that don't really practice in there before that big rehearsal. But during that big rehearsal, those K through, uh, K through third grade kids, they definitely know or should know what they're doing when they get on that stage. Their teachers don't know any of it because they've never seen the song or heard the song before. They don't know what their students are doing, but I've written the information out for the teachers to help them out. Okay, so this letter is particularly per pertaining to the nighttime performance. However, I do hand this out during the rehearsal. So you can see that the run through will be done out of order so that fifth grade is finished by 10 o'clock because that's the end of their resource time. Since we are doing the finale early, you may leave when your class's song is over or stay for the duration of the rehearsal. And then I say the program order and what they need to do. So let's just read through this one really quickly. It says, um, make sure they are wearing their necklaces. So I made some sort of, they were doing a pinata song. So I think I had a poinsettia maybe, I can't remember, <laughs> necklace that I made for them. Um, the students will e enter through the backstage gym door, place the students on a blue X with the taller students in the back. You can mix up the classes. So this is two classes together, two first grade classes. 
Since they are all doing the same dance, they will exit through the backstage office side door and return to the holding room. There will be eight songs and some speaking parts before they re-enter through the front stage office door for the finale. For the finale, so that they can really see this is the stage, these teachers are here, this group is here, this group is here, so on and so forth. So they can get the idea of where they're supposed to be standing on the stage. Okay. Okay, so it's the week of the program and you are still expected in most cases to teach your classes. I never do structured lessons during program week. Um, a lot of times if I can, I'll just show a video and I will be sitting there working on program stuff right there while the kids are watching a video. And the video is always a music based video. A lot of times my students, especially the older ones, like if they see me sitting there folding programs, they might ask if they can do it for me. And I'm like, here, here you go. You work on that while I'm working on something else. <laughs> um, so it's, it's kind of nice to have a chance to get that stuff done, but the students are still coming in. And I always tell the students when they come in, okay, it's program week. So I've got a big program that I'm putting on, on, you know, such and such a night and your class isn't in it, but what I need for you to do is I need for you to just watch this video while I'm finishing getting things together. Meanwhile, during that week, I usually, depending on the class, will give my program students a break. So if we've worked really hard, we've been working hard for eight weeks on this program, and the program is gonna be in a couple days, and I know that there's gonna be a big rehearsal that we're gonna run through everything again, I might actually give them a break and we not go through it at all. But if they've been struggling, then I will go through the program piece again. But uh, I won't spend the entire class time usually working on the program. I like to give them kind of a little reward. Here we go, let's watch this video. You've been working really hard. So now it's the night of the program. So I usually do not go home on program day until after the program is completely over with. So school gets out and I will take all of my instruments and take them into their holding rooms or I will put the signs up outside the classroom saying so-and-so's class comes here and I will get all those little programs ready to go and place them up front somewhere so that they're ready to be passed out. And I will set up the sound equipment. So I will do all that right after school. And by this point, it's probably about 4.30 or so. And then I usually will go out to a restaurant or a fast food place or whatever, get something to eat, calm my nerves. I might go with somebody, with some friends, or I might just go by myself because I tend to need to kind of just think about it. Do I have everything in place and that sort of thing? And just kind of breathe and calm down and make sure that I'm centered to do this program because nothing is going to be perfect. It's never perfect because life isn't perfect, but you're going to do the best that you can and just hope that you have enough things in place that it's going to go really, really well and everybody's going to enjoy it. So then when I come back from dinner, I will change because I always wear a different set of clothes for the program because during the day I'm crawling around on the floor plugging in mic cords, etc., and I don't wanna be wearing something like that that night for the actual performance. So parents start coming in and I go around and I'm checking to see, do I have teachers in classrooms yet? Because as soon as I have teachers in a particular holding space, I can go to the microphone and I can say, all of my friends that are in such and such a class, you can go down to room seven, your teacher is there to watch you. And then once the program starts, I just sit down and I run through it with the kids and we have a great time doing it. And the parents always seem to enjoy no matter what happens, even if their kids um, forgot what they were doing, if the music didn't start on time, if there was an instrument missing, the parents are really, really happy to see their children up on the stage doing something. And then once the program's over with, I go and tear down the sound equipment and I have already asked all of my teachers, hey, whatever props you have in your holding room, can you just put them outside the music room door? And um, that will help me and save me some trips. And then I just pull everything into the music room. I don't bother to put anything away. It's just all hanging out in the music room. And then I go home for the night. And I am usually exhausted physically, 
mentally, emotionally exhausted, okay? But it is really, really worth it to see these students get up there and perform and see all the hard work that they put into it and that they have fun because you have to remember that when it comes to elementary music, we might be the only time that they ever perform musically in anything for their entire life. Okay, that's all I have to say about programs. I hope that you got some tips and tricks about how to create one for yourself. And I hope that you remember to subscribe. Have a great day.